Well, thank you, Jason. As he mentioned, this upcoming Wednesday, we do have what we call our quarterly conference. So once every three months, our church gathers together. Um, we hear some reports from different ministries and ministers in our church. We also make decisions as needed during those times where the members of our church are able to vote on certain issues or like budget-related items. And so this upcoming Wednesday night, this week, we'll have one of those meetings. It'll be at 7 o'clock p.m. right here in our sanctuary. And uh, we'll be sharing some more information about our student pastor candidate. Um, he has told his lead pastor of his intentions to leave and to come here and join our church, but he's not yet told his youth group or the rest of their church. And so we are trying to uh, be as discreet as possible about his candidacy until he's been able to share that information. But like Jason mentioned, we'll share some more Wednesday and we'll be happy to entertain any questions that you might have about our candidate. Um, so very, very grateful for that update. If uh, you're here and you've ever served on a search team, you know it's a daunting task. It's one that this group's been working on for eight months, really over eight months. And um, so we're very thankful for them and the work the Lord's done in helping us identify a candidate. Now, if you have a Bible, why don't you turn with me to Proverbs chapter number three. I want to continue today in a little uh, series we're doing on decisions and decision making. Uh, the, the idea here is that we make lots of decisions, all of us, all the time. And often we're called upon to make incredibly important decisions. And so as the people of God, it is always a good idea to look to God's word to see what he has to say about those sorts of things. Um, I read this past week in a uh, 2018 article from Psychology Today that somewhere somebody took a tally of all the decisions they made or estimated all the decisions that they may make over the course of a day. And they guessed that for an adult who only sleeps seven hours a day during the remaining 17 hours of wakefulness, they make approximately 35,000 decisions over the course of a day. The math there breaks down to roughly 2,000 decisions per hour and one decision every two seconds. Decisions like, where will I turn my head? Will I listen to this? Will I entertain a thought about what will go on later this afternoon? Decisions, regular decisions. In a similar study, researchers at Cornell University estimate that we make 226.7 decisions each day simply on what food we will or will not eat. We make lots of decisions. And accordingly, we need to look to God's word to see what uh, sort of decisions he wants us to make. And really more importantly and more in keeping with my philosophy as we approach these sorts of questions is not just what decision God wants us to make, but what kind of person does God want us to be? Because I believe if we're the right kind of person, godly, faithful, humble persons, those kinds of persons are best suited to make the right kinds of decisions. So if you were here last Sunday, we looked at a story from very early in church history. In fact, in the, in the uh, chapter of Acts number one, and we saw the early church faced with a decision and they weren't really sure what to do. So we looked at that, saw it as a pattern for what to do when we're not sure what to do. Today, we're in Proverbs chapter three in what is a pretty popular verse. I had somebody come up to me after our first service this morning and say, hey, that's my life verse. And I, I've often heard that from others. Especially so, it's an important verse when we come to decision making in our life. There was a great figure in the Old Testament by the name of Solomon. He was the son of King David and he himself would reign over the kingdom of Israel during its most illustrious and st uh, stable and wealthiest of, of days. King Solomon early in his tenure as the king was approached by God in a dream. You can read about this story in 1 Kings 3. We're not gonna turn there this morning, but that's where the story is told. Solomon went up on this mountain to worship God on the occasion of him having become the king. And while he was there after this big elaborate worship um, ordeal, Solomon fell asleep. And the Bible says that God appeared to him in a dream. And God said to him, Solomon, ask anything you want of me and I'll give it to you. And Solomon responded to that vision by telling God, I'm very young, I have a tremendous amount of responsibility being the king over your people, God. So the thing that I'm gonna ask for is that you'd give me wisdom to lead your people well. Let me read to you God's response to that request. It comes to 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 10. It says there in God's word that it pleased the Lord, Solomon had asked for this. And so God said to Solomon, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but you have asked for yourself 
understanding to discern what is right, behold, I will now do according to your word. Behold, God said, I give you a wise and a discerning mind so that none like you has been before you and none like you shall arise after you, which is a very biblical Old Testament way of God saying to him, you're the wisest person, Solomon. Next to the Lord Jesus himself, you will be the wisest person who's ever walked the face of the earth. And so what if, just by some strange stretch of a hypothetical scenario, what if the wisest person who ever lived wrote down some advice for us about how we should lead our lives and better yet, about how we should make decisions? That would probably be pretty helpful to look at, right? Well, that's right where we're at this morning. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 comes right from, as he was inspired by the Lord to record this for our benefit, Solomon gives us this wisdom. Let's read it together. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, God's word says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, know him and he will make your paths straight. This is God's word to us today. And from it, I wanna share with you three very simple but incredibly important steps that you can take to make sure you're making good decisions for you and your family. Listen, the purpose of our sermon today is not simply so that you can say, oh, well, now I can lead a more successful life because I have some, you know, a secret to successful decision making. This is not a, simply a how-to sermon. It's certainly not entertaining anything relatively known as prosperity theology, which, hey, if you just serve God, he'll make your life easier. That's not at all what we're saying. But when we look to what God's word says about making decisions, the, the focus is always on God wants to shape you into a certain kind of person. As it turns out, he wants us to become more and more like Jesus Christ. And the more that we transform into the likeness of Christ in that sense, the better prepared we are to enter into difficult seasons in our life or to make life-changing decisions. We can bear the burden of those great responsibilities of decision-making better when we're the kinds of person that God called us to be. So with that in mind, let me share with you three things I think that are contained in this wonderful little proverb, which will help you make decisions well, not just for your life, but especially if you're here today and you're married or you have children or you lead a family or an extended family, people are counting on you to make decisions well. So let's make those good decisions together in the light of the truth of God's word. Step number one, you need to have a close personal relationship with Jesus. Now, that's a real Sunday school, churchy kind of answer. I get that. Many of you may be here this morning and you may think to yourself, well, well, well duh, I know that. I'm supposed to be saved, but how's that going to help me uh, make the right kind of decisions? Here's the premise, all right? If you want to make good, godly decisions, you need to have a good, godly relationship with Jesus. As you grow closer to Christ, you will understand better the kind of life that he wants you to lead, the kind of goals, the kind of values that should, that should be motivating your decision making. These things should be informed not just by what we want to do or what looks successful or what our career aims are. Ultimately, our relationship with Jesus should fuel the fire of every decision that we make. And so this wonderful little proverb begins its secret for successful decision-making by pointing to a close personal relationship with Jesus. Where do I get that idea? Well, look at the first phrase. Just that first half of verse number five, it uses a, 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 a three different words there that all emphasize a close personal relationship. That first word is the word trust, right? We're called on to trust in the Lord. Trust, I believe, is the most personal thing that you can give to someone. And God is here asking us to give him our trust as we make important decisions. Secondly, you'll notice in this line, the word Lord is used, and it's a special word 
to refer to God. In the Bible, there are all sorts of different terms, both in the ancient Hebrew, from which we translate our English Old Testaments, even on into the Greek of the New Testament. Um, there's all sorts of different words for the names of God. Many of you may even have participated at some point in the past in a Bible study that focused entirely on the different names for God. Well, the one we see here in Proverbs 3 is the most special name of all because it's the unique personal name of God. It implies a certain personal knowledge of who God is because as it turns out, God's not just some, some force some power out in the heavenlies that we hope we're able to tap into with our lives. God is a person who can be known personally. And there's this story early in the book of Exodus. Uh, probably my favorite character from the Old Testament is the leader, Moses. And in this seminal moment in Moses's life as a leader of God's people, when God called him to be a leader for the very first time, God appeared to Moses out in the desert in the form of a burning bush. Maybe you've heard of this story. And there emanating from that burning bush was a voice. It was the voice of the Lord. And he commissioned Moses to lead the people out from under Egyptian bondage. And Moses has lots of questions about this, one of which was, okay, let's just say I do go back to Egypt where your people are enslaved. Let's say I get there and I tell them, hey, God has called me to lead you to freedom. What do I say when they ask me which God or what's the name of the God who has sent you? And the Lord replied with this word, the word we see there in verse number five, it's the word Yahweh the personal name of God. It translates roughly, I am or I exist. It's God's personal name. And wherever you see in your Bible, if you have a Bible this morning, whether you're holding a Bible or some smart device, if you want to look down real quick at verse five, if that word Lord is in all capital letters, that's the way most English translations of the Bible nod their cap to the idea of, okay, this isn't just any word for God. This is the personal name of God. So if you see Lord in all uppercase, that's the word Yahweh. It signifies that you know someone personally, right? How do you do that? How do you get to know someone personally? There's really only one way. You spend time with them. That's how you know someone personally. As we think about intersections in our life where we're going to be called upon to make incredibly important decisions that we want to get right. What God's word emphasizes is this, the God we serve is a person. We are called upon not just to behave well or to learn Bible stories. We're called upon to know the person who is God, our Yahweh. When you get to know someone, you learn about them, what they like, what they don't like, what they prefer. You learn someone's pet peeves or their sense of humor. You learn their sports allegiances. Or, or if you take a personality test, you can verify whether the results seem pretty accurate or not. No, those are all things you can do only if you have that personal relationship. So we're called upon to trust in a personal God, not just the big man upstairs or the forces of the universe, but in a personal God. And we're called to do so with all of our heart. In the Bible, our hearts represent the center of our thinking, of our feeling, and most importantly, the center of our deciding or our decision making. And we're to trust in God with all of our heart. Now, what's that trust look like? Let me just take a, a short little detour to talk about this word trust just for a moment. When we say, I trust in God, y'all, we're not just saying, hey, I've made a decision for God, you know, at Bible school many years ago. We're not just saying, hey, I was, you know, I was baptized and my name is on a roll. When we talk about trusting in God, ultimately what we're saying is, I believe that he is good enough and competent enough that I should do what he says. And so I trust him, and that trust is demonstrated by doing what he says, becoming the kind of person that he's called us to be. So that's our first step in successful decision-making. We need to have a close, personal relationship with God, and you can do that. Many of you have already done that. Many of you have that now. You're thinking of it, and you're grateful for it now, but if you're here this morning, and you've never given your heart to Jesus, let me tell you, Jesus 
already knows you better than anyone else knows you. He knows everything about you, good, bad, and everything in between. And get this, even knowing all the, ba- all the bad, the Bible says that Jesus loves you and that he gave himself for you to die on the cross so that you can have that personal relationship with him. So listen, if you've never given your heart to Jesus, I don't care what important decisions you have in front of you, there's nothing more important than giving your heart to Christ. And you can do that today. Let me share with you a second step in our successful decision making. We need to also win the battle for your thought life. Win the battle for your thought life. Now, where do I get that idea here in our passage? Look at me at verse number five. It says, after we're called upon to trust in the Lord, we're told, and don't rely on your own understanding. So that's where your thought life comes into play. We're told to trust in God, right? Follow what he says, trust him enough to to obey his direction in our life. And we're called not just to rely on our own understanding. Now, that doesn't mean we check our brains at the door when we become Christians. It doesn't mean we don't think through all of the different practical ramifications that will follow from whatever decisions we think we need to make. But it does mean that ultimately, what we lean upon in our decision making is not just our brains or our gut feeling, but we lean upon the directive of God. You know, we're getting ready for football season. I warned our first service this morning, accordingly, you should be on the lookout for more football-related sermon illustrations because, you know, we dudes just kind of see the world through the grid of whatever we're into at any given time. So football's coming around, and I'm just going to start seeing the world through the lens of football. So they say that uh, on a football field, the game is won or lost at the line of scrimmage, right? The big dudes up front, got some offensive linemen here shaking their head. The big dudes up front, when the ball is first snapped, that all just run into each other, right? Whoever's stronger and who can last the longest there, typically they will control the flow of the game in a very similar way. The way that a football game is won at the line of scrimmage, your life as a child of God and the decisions that you're called upon to make, those important decisions, those will be won or lost in the arena of your thought life in the arena of your thought life the word in verse 5 which says do not rely on your own understanding that word rely means to lean it's a picture of someone who though they may be stumbling they reach out to grab something and lean upon it so that they don't lose their way or that they don't fall over It's not that we're not supposed to think, it's that our thinking will let us down because the Bible teaches, even for the smartest, most prudent, wisest one of us, our thinking has been affected by sin. The Bible teaches that sin breaks us at a very, very deep level, the heart level, the mind level, the level of our bodies and the level at which we make decisions. Accordingly, we should lean upon God when we make these decisions, trusting Him so that we don't fall, not just trusting in our own decision-making computing power. As it turns out, our ability to make decisions can often be like a broken scale, right? You step on it, it works. Right, it'll tell you a number. It might be higher than what you really weigh. It might be lower than what you really weigh. But the truth is, without some outside help, you're not really gonna have an accurate read on the situation, which is why we look to God, whose scale is not broken. The Bible teaches in Isaiah chapter 55 that God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He, he tells us, listen, I don't think about things the same way that you think about things. There's, a, there's this wonderful example in the Gospels. Early in the ministry of Christ, the, the first occasion where Jesus starts sharing with his disciples that he was going to have to die someday upon the cross. You can read it in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus is sharing with his disciples really for the first time, hey, there's going to come a time where I'm going to give my life to pay for people's sins. And that just blew the disciples' mind. So much that Peter actually responded, and the Bible says there he rebuked Jesus with something along the lines of, hey, that's not the way things need to go, right? So Jesus was thinking about those decisions very differently than his disciples. Jesus responded to Peter, Peter who had really given his life for Christ to follow him up to that point, and he said, get thee behind me, Satan, 
For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but you're setting your mind on the things of man. It's a wonderful illustration for why we should not just rely on our own understanding, but we've got to trust in the Lord as we make decisions. Let me give you three little warning signs. This, this is a litmus test of sorts for each one of us to discern whether we're trusting in our own understanding or whether we're trusting in the Lord as we come to make important decisions in our life, all right? So three warning signs that demonstrate whether you're relying on your own understanding. Number one, anxiety. And I told you this is the battle for your thought life. Dear child of God, if you struggle with the fear of the unknown, let me remind you, anxiety is what happens when we forget that God is the one who's really in control. Not us, not people around us who have the power to make decisions that can greatly affect us, but God is in control. And so if you feel your anxious self just working itself up into knots, listen, I'm not trying to make you feel bad or feel less than, I'm just simply saying that's a good indication that you're relying on your own understanding to help you through a situation. Instead, we should be leaning upon God. The second warning sign is discouragement. Discouragement is what happens when things aren't going well and we've forgotten who's in charge. God is in charge. The third warning sign is pride, which I really see as the heads and tails, pride and discouragement. Discouragement is what happens when, hey, we think we're in charge and things aren't going well. Pride is what happens when things kind of are going well and we still make the mistake of thinking we're in charge. Listen, if you're going through a good season in your life, if you've experienced success as a child of God, if the Lord is blessing your home, if he's blessing your work, be thankful, right? Tell yourself, these are good days, enjoy them. But remember, it's not because you're so great, so smart, so successful. It's because God's in control and he's chosen to bless you. And so if you feel in your heart a sense of pride, discouragement, or anxiety welling up as you think about important affairs in your life, just take note that's usually an indication that you're losing the battle for your thought life. Instead, we must place our trust in the Lord. Let me share with you a third and a final step this morning here from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which will help you make the right decision. Focus on being the right kind of person. And I've already tipped my hat to this um, earlier in our sermon, but really this is the main point today. We should not work so much as children of God to just find out what single decision we must make. Fail-proof searching is what we often do. I want to know exactly what to do. I want to take risk out of the equation altogether. God's Word doesn't seem to work that way. What God is so much more focused on, He wants you to be the right kind of person. He's more concerned with that than He is with any single decision I think that you'll ever have to make. The right kind of person will make the right kind of decisions. You've heard the old saying, um, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. The same applies here. You tell somebody what decision to make. I mean, that's what we want. We, we want to flip a coin and know that God will tell us by way of what side that that coin lands on what we should do, but that's not how it works. We want the answer to the question to be specific, direct, and to happen pretty quickly. And what God's concerned with is, I want you to be a godly, humble person of Christian virtue to represent me in this world, to be a light in the midst of darkness. Yes, decisions will come and go. They are important. But what's more important is being a godly individual. Our, our, our passage says in verse 6, in all of your ways, know him. In every one of life's pursuits, know him, be involved with him, relate to him, experience him. You know, I remember 15 years ago or so when I was still a youth pastor, uh, one, of, one of the better sermon series that I gave to my students was a sermon series on dating and relationships. It was for our older students, but it was called The Total Package. And the premise was, how do you find the one, right? That's what young people are looking for. I want to find the one. I don't want to fall in love with the wrong one. I want to meet the one. And I taught those students, and I'm still 
preaching this message today. If you want to find the one, you need to work on becoming the one for someone else, right? You work on you and God will put you in the right path of the person that you're supposed to be with in a very similar way. If you've got a big decision to make, what's most important is your faith in God, your growth as a child of God, being the right kind of person precedes making the right kinds of decisions. And so how can I focus on being the right kind of person? Two things, real quickly right here at the end, two things I think that come very naturally from uh, verse number six. You need a comprehensive approach to your spiritual life. Comprehensive means it includes everything. Most folks prefer a compartmentalized approach to their spiritual life, which is to say, you know, I can take this part of my life the Sunday morning part, for example, and I'll give that to God. But what happens on Friday night, I'm going to put that in a compartment over here so that those two things don't really have to get close to one another. But that doesn't work. Matter of fact, that's kind of a delusion. It's not true. They very much relate to one another and connect to each other. I have found over the years, people often prefer delusion to facing the truth. And if you think you can lead a compartmentalized spiritual life and grow in your walk with Christ, friend, let me tell you, you are deluded, which is to say you're not seeing things for the way that they really are. It's not always easy to do that, but, you know, God's Holy Spirit can, can come right up next to us and give us the courage and the strength we need to own up to some areas in our life where maybe we're not being honest. We need a comprehensive approach to our spiritual life in all your ways. Know him, and he will make your paths straight. Final thing I'll share with you this morning is that we need a confident approach to our spiritual life. Isn't that what verse number six tells us? In all your ways, know him, and he will make your paths straight. That, that should give you some confidence today. If you trust in God and you make your life's pursuit simply to be the person that he wants you to be. You look to his word for guidance. You, you look to his people or his church for community. If you do those things in your life, God will mold you day by day. It's not, it's not often glamorous, right? There's not gonna be some celebration or some sign to tell you you're doing it right. Uh, but if you will trust him over time, he will mold you and shape you into the person that he wants you to be. And with that comes a great confidence so we can make decisions knowing God will help us. You focus on being the right kind of person, God will always help you to make the right kind of decisions. Let me invite you, if you would, to bow your heads with me.